coming up on the DMT One to One Show, episode 60, on the 14th of May 2014, an interview with Bob Barbieri, the CEO of the company Dubset. So hi Bob, thanks for joining me on the show today, how's it going? It's going terrific. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to have you. So, uh, of course, uh, last week uh, we uh, covered uh, uh, during the DMT at the Live at the Great Escape uh, uh, the investment round, uh, the B in, uh, round investment led by Rhapsody. So uh, it would be fantastic if you could start by introducing Dubset as a company uh, to our listeners. Sure. Dubset was founded in 2009 and is a music technology company. Um, the basis of the company is founded in developing technologies that resolve the rights in complex um, music content. Complex music content, most often described as mixed content in the DJ world. So uh, the sweet spot for this company is taking essentially a one-hour mixtape, live performance, um, radio show, podcast that contains um, 10, 20, 30 different samples of music, um, processing that, registering it. So we've, we created this global registry. Um, once we register and process it through our partnership with Gracenote, we identify all the way down into three-second uh, audio files what's being played in each three-second audio file. Um, we then reassemble that into what we call a mixed DNA. Um, once we have a mixed DNA, that piece of content can now be shared globally with consumers with data coming back from the distributor as to all of the listener data points. Here's where they started, here's where they stopped, here's where they restarted, fast forward, rewind, and so forth. And because we've parsed these down into three-second audio files, we can, in a very granular and precise way, provide back exactly what sample tracks in that mix were listened to. Yeah. Why that's important, Andrea, is that without that data, you could never monetize that content. Sure. So all of these free sites were born, the sound clouds and mixed clouds and, and various other sites, offering this content free because without the ability to resolve the rights, you couldn't, in fact, charge anyone to listen to the music, or even if you weren't going to charge somebody to listen to the music, to have brand sponsorships of that content, you'd have to resolve the right. So our technology has been trialed over the last two years um, by companies such um, such as SiriusXM and, and others, um, and we now are market ready, sort of taking the car out of the garage, yeah. um, and, uh, and it's ready to go. So we're going to enable content creators, DJs, producers, labels, whomever that is that's got this long format content that they've never really been able to distribute any way other than free. And oh, by the way, when you distribute it free, there's still supposed to be royalties associated with it. Yeah. Right. So even on a free level, the world should be processing uh, rights and, and royalties. But anyway, we're going to enable these folks to connect across our platform in sort of an agnostic neutral exchange and meet all the DSPs of the world so that, in essence, a DJ could share his music through Rhapsody, through Beats, through um, uh, Pandora, through yeah. no Nokia. Um, sure. whomever wants to distribute that. And so uh, last week we were talking about the fact that you know the company's got both, uh, of course, a back-end side of it and a front-end, of course, so the front-end being the future uh, FM and the back-end being those uh, uh, royalty recognition technologies that you just talked about. And so how much uh, uh, focus is there from the company on, on the front-end versus the back-end or do those two sort of go along on a parallel path? You know, it's a great question. We've put a lot of our energy into the consumer-facing side, the future.fm, simply because we needed to have that in order to build what we call MixBank, which is our artist-facing uh, platform, right. and MixScan, the underlying technology. So we built out this consumer platform. We just launched on May 6th, as you probably have seen, a new UI UX on the web, the new iOS uh, version is coming out in about a week and a half. Um, but we've invested a lot into that and into the mix scan technology that underlies the, the rights and, and resolution points. Um, moving forward, you're going to see more of our development going into MixBank and continue into MixScan. Because the future.fm essentially is finished in our, in our world. Um, the DSPs, the Rhapsodies, and other folks have the opportunity to use that as a turnkey platform if they want to put it adjacent or within their service. Or they can just offer the music out of their own library. Yeah. Um, 
as if we were provide the future.fm is almost more of a label to them and just providing 100,000 hours of new content to them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, we had a statement from uh, Rhapsody that said, you know, that the, uh, the investment that they had in this uh, new round of funding uh, sort of demonstrates uh, the commitment of the company uh, to EDM. So in that sense, do, do, do you feel like uh, uh, they were interested in the uh, uh, in the back end side of things, in the future of FAM? You know, last week, we were, my panelists were talking about the fact that it would be very cool for Rhapsody to be able to integrate some of the content you have on the future uh, onto Rhapsody itself. And, and so what, where do you think the interest stemmed from? Well, you know, Rhapsody is an interesting company, Andrea. They um, they've gone through a lot of changes over the last year for the for the better. Yeah. Um, as you know, they operate under Napster almost everywhere except for the U.S. Um, and they built some amazing partnerships and relationships with mobile operators like Telefonica and others. And they're arguably now one of the fastest, probably with Spotify, the two fastest growing music services in the world. So they're sort of stepping out of their comfort zone. And this investment in, in us was, as you saw, first for them. Um, we're working closely with their team. The, the, the interesting part of the business for us is, and I come from a technology world where I build these sort of neutral platforms that solve marketplace inefficiencies. Um, there's already been some questions about neutrality with a Rhapsody investment. So A, it's a, it's a minority investment. Um, B, it was a great investment from our part because now what's the natural extension? Once you have the future.fm all figured out, the natural extension is, okay, now start plugging in music services. Yeah. So the Rhapsody yeah. service is in the process of plugging in. There's definitely a commitment on their part, Andrea, into EDM dance. And, and EDM is much, as you know, much broader than just electronic, right? We have a, a massive amount of pop top 40 mixes that I don't know if the – EDM folks would even want classified as EDM. Right. Um, but all of that content is very interesting. We have country mixes that are real interesting. And what I think Rhapsody sees and other music services, we're in discussions or various level of integrations with about 10 other music services right now. Um, what they see is this is an amazing discovery vehicle for music, right? So you get a mix curated by a top DJ in the world Within that, you you hear a track that may be new to you or something that you really like, particularly the way it's mixed. You can click on a button and basically put that individual track into your Rhapsody playlist or into your Rhapsody um, music library. And that's what's exciting to those folks. That's awesome. And so, uh, you know, talking about the fact that, you know, uh, one of the things that came up last week where we're talking about the fact that uh, some people think that EDM is a bubble. Uh, but at the same time, uh, well, what's really I want to stress about the company is that you guys have been around for a long time. You, you're not really a new company that's come up as part of this bubble. You've actually been around since 2008. And so the interesting thing here is that you have created a technology that even if the cycle makes it so that in five years maybe dance music is not as popular as it is now, it will still be a very big business and a very consistent sort of in income stream, right? Yeah, so, you know, DJs have been around for 70 years curating yeah. music for uh, for fans, right? And, and the, the whole notion of curation is sort of the, the buzzword, right? My wife curated my dinner for me last night, you know. Uh, everybody's curating everything. But the reality is, is DJs have created music, whether it be for dance or pure listening pleasure for 70 years. And, um, you know, like anything else, there's going to be a crest and, you know, a wave um, that rises up and down behind EDM. I think the true EDM, quote unquote, electronic uh, segment of it um, may have a window of, um, you know, life that's still growing in leaps and bounds. But I think what we've learned is over the course of history is that people really like their music curated by professional people, right? Yeah. There's just that, that sort of sixth sense that a DJ has. And, and an algorithm is good, but it can't do it. I'll give you an interesting statistic for, in a minute from the show out in, uh, in California last week. But um, an algorithm likely also can't find a way to mash Jimi Hendrix and Katy Perry together in a way that 90% of the people who listen to it go, wow, that's pretty amazing, right? So I may be able to predict the next song after Katy Perry, um, but it, it probably couldn't figure out that Jimi Hendrix may make a, an interesting mash with it. So I'll give you this, Andrea. I, I just hosted a panel on curation out at Music Biz in L.A., 
And I asked the audience um, by show of hands how many folks um, preferred their music curated by the world's um, best algorithms that, you know, whether it be Pandora or Spotify or, or the best technology that really could figure out what that next right song is for you. Um, of the audience of about 200, um, two folks raised their hands. Right. The rest of the folks preferred their music curated by a human. So I think that said a lot for our business, um, whether it's, you know, and the room was not filled with 18 to 25 year olds. That room was music executives, senior professionals from the industry. And I think when you look at, you know, the 40 year old who says, I'd rather have my music curated by a DJ, you're like, wow, I, is that EDM or what really is that? But to me, that's our world, right? Yeah. EDM is sort of the cool way to describe our company because it's the buzz and people think we're more interesting because we say we're EDM. But the reality is, is content creators, curators of long form content, getting that content in a way that's distributable globally through the, the global music services. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, talking about companies that may want to, uh, you know, uh, get, in, get in touch with you guys, uh, what's the best way? Is it through your website? If they were uh, thinking of potential synergies with their own service, and a lot of startups are, are listening to the show right now. So, Yeah, so um, if you're an artist, the best way to get in touch with us is through the website. Um, we've got ways that you can begin setting up um, your own profiles and, and begin setting up content. Um, our artist management team will help you work through potential featuring of your content. Yeah. Um, if you're a larger content creator or aggregator, um, certainly that's more uh, on a business development side of the business with us where we look at a, a bigger picture opportunity. Um, we've done that with labels. We've done that with um, Noise House Productions, one of the largest uh, podcast um, production companies in the world. We've now done a partnership with them where we're going to have the ability to begin monetizing podcasts for all the top DJs in the world and connecting brands to them in a very exciting way on the platform. Um, and then there's the digital service providers or music services. And I would say anyone that's a content aggregator, sort of business development partner, or even um, music service would best to be reach out to myself or to uh, one of my business development folks. We're still a relatively, you know, small organization. We run it lean and, yeah. uh, you know, we took this Series B and we're now growing. So, uh, but it's never, it's never too big an opportunity for me to work on or too small an opportunity. So they could always reach out to me. That's great. And finally, I wanted to, I can't uh, uh, avoid asking you since you mentioned it, that, uh, you know, uh, about your experience as becoming sort of a music uh, uh, business executive, uh, in a sense, by, by the way of the company, because you, you weren't directly involved in music before. So how have you found uh, getting into the space? Uh, and uh, was there a crazy learning curve? Yeah, uh, it, it is a crazy learning curve, especially considering the type of music we're in. Um, yeah. Everything's happening. <laughs> everything happens so fast. And, you know, to think of how much content is created, you know, the you, you go back to the Bruce Springsteen days, you know, big fan of Bruce Springsteen and you get an album a year of new content, right? When that album came out, that was a big deal. And you almost had to appreciate other artists because there just wasn't enough new content coming out from any one artist. Yeah. Um, when you think about what goes on today with these DJs as artists, fans of DJs actually are able to get new content on a weekly basis from these folks. So the volume of content that's coming from this segment, and again, it's not just electronic, it is all kinds of, of, of mixed content. The volume of content is enormous, enormous. And it's amazing to me to think that we're now able to unlock all of this content for distribution by d everywhere. I mean, there's there's literally millions of hours a week, Andrea, of new content coming out in this in the space in the DJ curated space, and it's growing weekly. It's not getting any smaller. I'm sure you've recognized now. You know, everybody's a DJ. They, they the technology has evolved to where on your iPhone you can download a Tractor app and mix tracks right on your iPhone. So. Um, for me, my background is, is technology um, and resolving uh, inefficient or, or f sort of fixing inefficient marketplaces. We 
built yeah. the, some of the world's largest uh, electronic digital media marketplaces and advertising and telecommunications. Um, I know music people like to say music's a different animal. Every industry has its quirks. Yeah. By no means does music not have its quirks. But the inefficiencies in digital media sort of transcend the, the, the form of media or the form of content. So what I'm able to build and deploy here is um, is very similar to what we did in, in other industries. And it works and it's great and it's scalable. I was fortunate enough to be able to bring um, my CTO along who right. um, built the world's largest telecommunications exchange. We moved 10% of the world's voice and data traffic with this uh, with this platform. And uh, hopefully we're going to be able to move a lot of the world's uh, music traffic now. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's fantastic. And thanks so much for your time, Bob, today. It was great having you. Uh, thank you so much. It was a, a pleasure joining you. And again, uh, check out uh, dubset.com for the main company's website. And also check out thefuture.fm for the more consumer-facing uh, part of the company. Thank you.